the pandemic really <laughs> drove a massive change for us. In a course of two days in March, we basically lost 75% of our business because all the restaurants were shut down. So we panicked and um, we were really concerned about our employees. So we created this online fish market and um, we didn't know how it would um, be received. And uh, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I guess, um, it was an overwhelming success. Welcome, uh, I'm Jim Mason with Future Foodcast. Hi, my name is Sachin Sharma. I also work with the uh, Future Foodcast uh, along with uh, Jim and um, uh, really interested in this journey. I'm, I'm, I'm also a doctorate student, so kind of doing a study similar to this field, uh, more into the blockchain aspect of it and the supply chain aspect. Of it. So it'll be great to listen to you, Guy. And Guy, uh, yeah, let's turn it over to you. And if you can introduce yourself and uh, Organic Ocean, that would be great. Yeah. My name is Guy Dean. I'm the president and GM for uh, Organic Ocean Seafoods up here in uh, beautiful Vancouver, Canada. Um, we are a vertically integrated seafood company. What I mean by that is we have our own fishing vessels. We also buy from uh, other harvesters, indigenous groups, uh, uh, responsible aquaculture programs, and we distribute that fish uh, throughout Canada. Um, we have some uh, celebrity chefs that we um, service in, in the U.S., uh, James Beard chefs and some Michelin star chefs in Singapore and uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, but uh, our biggest market is, is in Canada. Excellent. So, um, so your two primary markets, if I have it right, I'll say you're in the food service space with these chefs and restaurants, and then um, uh, you also have, I assume, some sort of retail channel as well? Um, yeah, well, we have our own direct-to-consumer retail uh, channel. Um, so um, people can, customer can uh, put an order in on our online fish market and have their seafood delivered to them the next day. So a per customer can actually put an order in before one o'clock uh, the previous day and it'll be on their doorstep the next morning. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, so, th yeah, that's, I've never even, even more incredible, Jim, is that that's all in recyclable or compostable packaging. So, yeah, and I, I want to learn a lot more about that as well. There, there's, like I said, uh, the first time I talked to you, I learned so much about what I didn't know. And I thought I knew about, about sustainability and the whole uh, food chain around fish. Um, so that was an excellent learning experience. Take me back a little bit. Tell me more about the founding of the company a little bit, Organic Ocean. You bet. So the company was founded by two fishermen who were essentially unhappy with their lot in life. Um, they were uh, fishing responsibly, um, sustainably, uh, using sustainable fishing methods, uh, basically hook and line, uh, troll gear. Uh, they weren't using nets. Um, and, um, what the, and then they were treating their fish really well. Uh, they were dressing them right on board the boat and um, you know, just really trying to create a premium product. What they found is they would bring the fish back to the offloading facility or dock or processor and their fish got just blended in with everybody else's fish and they got the same price as everybody else. So they weren't being rewarded for fishing more sustainably or fishing more or taking care of their fish uh, better than others. Um, and so they decided that they were going to start their own company and uh, start to sell their own fish right off the fishing dock. And that lasted, a, that didn't last very long before a, a, uh, um, a quite well-known uh, chef up here in, in Canada that had a seafood restaurant. Um, he found them and started buying their fish for his restaurant and he told two chefs and they told two chefs and pretty soon we had a pretty loyal following uh, from the chef community that supported them to the point where they were, now they were selling out all of their own product and then buying from other fishers and other harvesters uh, to keep the business going. So that's how the company originally started was through those, um, through those fishermen. Also, it's, it's nice to know that these fishermen, uh, my, my partners are also, uh, you know, second generation fishermen. They, um, 
their fathers before them were fishers as well. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, I, any business that starts out, you hope they have the opportunity like these guys did to make the right contacts. And as you said early on, they were just selling fish at the dock to, in a sense, get a fair price for what the value of what they were delivering. But somehow they were lucky enough to make the right contacts. And the best way to, in a sense, grow any business is to start at the top with, in a sense, the, I'll call it the gourmet consumers in that industry, and then just have it spread by word of mouth. It doesn't get better than that. Um, no, I think it's a building, a, in a sense, a business case of why you're different than the other guys that are out there. So that's, that's a great story on how they started. Um, so originally it was all food service. Uh, how did that start to change over time? Well, the, um, the pandemic really <laughs> drove a massive change for us um, because we were because we were selling into uh, Asia um, by November of 2019, we were already starting to see a wane in some of our sales um, that restaurants, people weren't going out in Asia and people were, uh, there was uh, quite an alarm was going off there. Um, but we didn't know how that would impact us. But in in the, in the um, in a course of two days in March, we basically lost 75% uh, of our business because all the restaurants were shut down. So we panicked and, um, and because we, you know, we, we, we wanted to keep the fish coming in, keep the fishers happy. We wanted to keep all our employees employed. That was really important for us. And we wanted to keep the business going in some fashion, but we were really concerned about our employees. So um, so we created this online fish market and, um, we didn't know how it would, um, uh, be received and, uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, I guess, um, it was an overwhelming success. And we just started originally selling, uh, into the Vancouver, we call it the lower mainland area because it's a whole bunch of cities together. Uh, so we just started selling uh, to, in the lower mainland, delivering in our own trucks. And as we became more and more successful and word through, and this was all through word of mouth, more people started to find us. We, we started to get inquiries from, you know, Toronto, which is the biggest city in Canada and other, other locations. And so uh, over time, we tried to figure out how, how are we going to be able to logistically deliver fish, frozen fish across Canada. Um, and, and so that was one of our challenges, but more importantly, it was how are we going to do it in a fashion that in, in and maintain the cold chain while while uh, delivering in packaging that the consumer could could uh, easily discard or reuse, um, and that actually was the biggest hangup. It was just finding the right packaging. Well, and it's interesting. You're, the pandemic, obviously, many businesses, including yours, uh, I'll call it, got crushed on the sales side during the pandemic for a variety of different reasons and circumstances, but. Um, what was interesting is sort of flipping back to your original model, which is, hey, we have a high quality fresh fish product. And as you know, <laughs> most of us in the pandemic had a hard time just getting toilet paper from a local store. Exactly. And so when you ask, what can I get? And you say most of the good food service outlets are closed, you know, the high end ones that your customer or their customers were used to going to, the fact that you can get a high end product fresh. Um, I'll put locally in Vancouver during the pandemic with your delivery concept, again, sort of recycled was a big, big deal. The fact that you found a way to move that out uh, into a broader market is really, I'll call it an interesting story. It makes sense that you have, I have a high quality product. I care about the stakeholders that depend on me, my fishermen, my employees, uh, and, and of course the existing customers that are open. But the, to go beyond that and then say, let's solve some other problems to say, let's create a bigger channel to make that uh, B2C market bigger um, must have been a big challenge. So tell me, give me some more background on the packaging problem. You had a packaging challenge, I'll say. And yeah, you, well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, take me through the steps of here was the packaging challenge we saw. Here's the stuff we looked at as options. And here's how we got to where we are now. Sure. Yeah. Um, so... 
in the Lower Mainland in Vancouver, we were delivering in our own re uh, refrigerated trucks. And so we could just deliver in regular boxes. And, you know, it was contactless home delivery. So we would uh, take our own trucks, run around town, drop off right at the um, at the consumer's home, knock on the door, and then uh, make sure they open, the, you know, back up, make sure they open the door and got their product. So it wasn't a matter of trying to use refrigerant or anything. We It was all being delivered in those refrigerated trucks. But we quit and, and we actually mimicked that model in Toronto when we first expanded and we used a fleet of refrigerated trucks that uh, delivered in the Toronto area as well. But what we found is in order for that to work, we had to send the product, the trucks out uh, like on a Thursday and the customer would get it the following Wednesday uh, we're trucking it across country um, and it wasn't really conducive for, you know, most consumers aren't, aren't uh, planning that far in advance on, on, on um, their groceries or buying. Right. So it wasn't really conducive for that, um, that instant gratification of purchase. Um, so uh, we, we needed to find another method and um, you know, you could pack, you can pack product in styrofoam and um, there is industrial recycle in re, styrofoam can be recycled industrially, but, um, but, you know, the average consumer can uh, recycle their styrofoam right. and doesn't know what to do with it. And usually it lands, lands in, in uh, the landfill. And we, we were, I was, Hell bent on not having that happen. Mm -hmm. I, there was no way I was going to deliver uh, our product in styrofoam to the consumer, and so we searched all across Canada and couldn't find uh, a solution or an alternative option. And then we reached down into looked down into the states and found that um, there were a number of uh, interesting options down there, and um, we brought we actually brought all of them up, and sampled all of them. And we tested them and uh, we found one was superior above all the other ones that we tested. It um, kept, the, um, kept uh, the product colder, longer, and really was a true alternative to styrofoam. And it was, uh, it's plant-based, it was compostable, uh, it's uh, recyclable. Um, so uh, we, so then, we were one of the first in Canada to bring this up, this product up and are now using that with dry ice and delivering using, you know, FedEx and UPS uh, to uh, the consumer's home, but it's next day service. So, you know, you see a lot of these seafood companies that are delivering their product and it takes two or three days. We, just like you mentioned in the beginning, you know, we sell and service the top chefs, some of the top chefs in the world and it was really important that our premium product was delivered in the same fashion that the chefs would want to receive the product in. And so that's why we, we were um, adamant that it had to be next day service. So, yeah, obviously that's a, a big breakthrough with the consumer. Because as you said, in my house, there is zero chance that we plan a menu a week in advance. Um, 48 hours is like we're doing well if we get that far in advance. Yeah. And the truth of it is... <laughs> All of us enjoy fish, and most of us could eat more fish than we do. Um, so that's so the opportunity to get I'll call it quality fresh fish um, is actually a challenge. So I can go to a local supermarket and get fish, but it's not what you're talking about, and it's it's very very different. Uh, the stuff I'm getting is frozen. It's been in a factory. It's a completely different kind of a process um, than what you go through. So uh, obviously, there's a big quality difference in the product, the fact that you can sort of flip that around from the point that I order and get it to me in 24 hours is actually an amazing story that you've been able to be successful with that. When, when I look back at who you service on the restaurant side and food service, um, you're, are you going to be using that method at all to deliver to them as well? or, or? Yeah. yeah, we yeah. do now. Um, and so we, um, especially when um, we get a you know, a chef that says, oh, I, I forgot to order this or I, I've missed my delivery window. Um, well, yeah, we now are able to career it out to them next day, which is awesome. awesome. So help, help me out um, with your, so 
talk about these chefs, these top chefs in these better restaurants, certainly understand your product. And I'm sure they're loyal customers, I'll say. Yeah. Clearly, you understand from your own business experience, the value of referral marketing. How, um, when you're trying to reach out to new, uh, I'll call it restaurants and food service outlets, how do you, how do you leverage the, I'll call it the great referrals that you get? Well, all, all, all our business, I mean, we don't invest in anything in marketing um, with the chef community. All, almost all of it is referrals from other chefs. Um, and uh, it, it's simply, you know, um, chef, the chef community is super tight. Um, when they, they'll often talk, they'll often talk with each other about where do you source your product from. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, the Air Canada creates a magazine annually called En Route Magazine, and it highlights the top 100 restaurants in Canada um, that's voted by, you know, food critics and judges. Um, and, you know, at last look, uh, last year's, uh, we serviced 39 out of the 100 restaurants. And, you know, there's a lot of restaurants that are are vegan or did they we just wouldn't service them or, or, right. or meat only so um so uh, you know that's a substantial that's a substantial um uh feather in our cap i guess it, you know for when when people find out about that we service the number one restaurant in canada the number two restaurant and the number four restaurant in canada yeah when people find out where do where they they purchase their product from you know, then then other chefs um, quickly um, quickly uh, lean towards us. And it's an amazing story because I've worked in business and I've owned my own companies and I've had to market. wasn't in the fish industry at all, but I know the challenge of, in a sense, establishing a brand, communicating, educating your customers, identifying the market. There's a lot of work there. It's not easy, and to know that in effect you I'll call it, hit the high end of the market and then it's more spreading like a virus, sort of like COVID, maybe a little bit slower, but it's the same concept fundamentally that it's a sort of a viral marketing concept that's worked so well. That's a phenomenal story. And it's interesting because I think somebody who's in your role where you're delivering, I'll call it a very different version of a product. It's not the same as the stuff that's out there from a commodity perspective. It can work in that role. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. it's, not, it's not for everybody, but it's certainly with what you're producing is upload a unique product. It makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's the draw, really. I mean, our our um, head, you know our head uh, the head salesperson or you know sales director is one of the founders, and so it's it's great when a chef can actually call up the fisherman and uh, and get the real scoop, you know, it's authentic. Um, it's artisanal, it's authentic. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's different than having just a, a sales rep that has, you know, thousands of SKUs that they're trying to sell to a, a restaurant uh, versus us who are very kind of laser focused on, on who our customer base is and, and uh, what we're trying to sell. Yeah, um, so, one question. Yeah, go ahead. Jim. Uh, what, uh, you know, I, I know this is, uh, you know, having a, such a nice product and actually making it available to the consumers and the restaurant, I think is, is really a great success story. But one thing I just wanted to understand, because you, you mentioned that you have your own fleets, cold storage trucks and, you know, stuff like that, which you were using to get to the local markets in Vancouver. But yeah. were you also uh, using other logistic providers to kind of, you know, like FedEx you mentioned, uh, so I just want to understand from the supply chain perspective, what was the ratio as to like currently, you know, how much are you using uh, your your own fleet to kind of, uh, you know, provide these products to the consumer and versus, you know, to any other market, you know? Well, it's interesting. Uh, in um, pre-pandemic, uh, our biggest market was actually Toronto, um, not local in Vancouver. Um, and in that, those cases, we used another uh, another distributor, a broadline distributor, to help us um, sell our product there. We would sell it, and then they would uh, de deliver it for us for a fee. Um, that that was, uh, but in other smaller regions, what we typically do is we consolidate the orders once or twice a week, 
and uh, fly it there um, and then have um, local courier companies that have refrigerated vehicles deliver it um, uh, right to the restaurants. Okay, so there's also a, a local sort of like a cold chain company that is in place here besides yeah. the... Oh, okay, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, so yeah, all they do custom work and, and so we would... Um, you know, it's 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 always a challenge when breaking into a new market trying to find um you know who who you can work with and find uh, those kind of uh those kind of supply chain uh partners for sure uh, yes. on, on this one i just want to build up on this one just a little bit uh, because this is of really good interest to me is about the the supply chain challenges that you're facing today i understand you know lack of resources uh is, is one big thing these days you know it's becoming very difficult to you know, finding the people to kind of have the, you know, these parts move in. So what, what, what are some of the challenges, you know, you just wanted to bring up that you are experiencing currently in your, in your business? Uh, our, our biggest challenge, uh, we, we often get asked if supply is an issue and supply isn't an issue for us. Um, we source, uh, you know, we have a wide um, sourcing channel uh, for product and we actually even, Although most of our product is from the Pacific Northwest region, um, we actually even import product from Japan and from Mexico, uh, niche items that we know that others aren't necessarily carrying. Um, but our biggest challenge is uh, labor. Uh, we can't get uh, we can't get a solid labor force. We have a we're a small company. We you know we're very family oriented uh, and. Um, so the employees we have are, are great and, and very loyal, um, but it's just finding more employees like that. And so is, is your local area, the, I'll call it the only manufacturing facility you have at this point? Is that yes. correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're right. You're trying to grow your employee base in that local area, obviously. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and actually that brings up a larger question, um, which is talking about, I'll call it education in general. So I'll say, in the food service side, the chefs, you have many chefs that understand what you have. So as you say, that viral marketing um, communication channel is working fine. And as you said, chefs talk to each other and they don't have, there's no education process needed. If I'm a chef and I'm t telling you what I do, that's good enough. You understand the whole thing. When you come over to the community side of the fence here and you're trying to, in a sense, strengthen your employee base, uh, is there any kind of partnerships you're doing with local government or anything else that help communicate who you are and what you're doing in a sense and what you're offering as a career role? Because it, you know, even with the pandemic, I think you guys came up with I'll call it a good solution to a challenging uh, problem. And you're probably a better base company today than you were before the pandemic. So you're, you know, I'd be shocked if you ever see another 75% drop in sales yeah. uh, at this point, uh, no matter what happens with the pandemic, given your ability to deliver. So that said, if you look at it, you're in an, a, an operating market. And I would agree that getting people to work in a plant is not the easiest thing. I think everybody has that challenge. But usually companies that are uh, not just family oriented, but oriented toward the employees, if you will, and have a strong uh, focus on that. Maybe you can tell me a little bit more about that and maybe how you partner with the community to try to work on that labor challenge. Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, um, so I think one of the bigger challenges is, is finding a cultural fit uh, for our organization as well. Um, you okay. know, even regardless of whatever role anybody plays within the organization, everybody seems to share the same kind of passion about the environment, about the social uh, side of our business um and, and just business in general and you know it was for example i'm getting i get got an email last week from one of the employee assembly uh people on the, the person one of the persons that works on the floor that was uh was talking about couldn't couldn't we recycle uh some of this plastic that we we get product brought in and under and i said yeah it's a brilliant idea i i mean i'm surprised that and so everybody shares that same kind of ethos um, and that so yeah and, and I think it's more finding those cultural fits uh, that are committed to working long term rather than just some uh, we're not just looking for 
uh, labor off the street. We want people that are going to be a good cultural fit within the organization. We work with, I mean, we work, uh, we ought, certainly work with local, the local um, city here, uh, uh, tourism, Richmond. Um, a lot of people know about us and promote us. Um, and so uh, we do get some help from that side, especially um, new immigrants uh, that come in. So the government has uh, uh, alerts us when they think that there is a good fit for somebody that come, that is a new immigrant and uh, applying under the government uh, uh, work program. Um, so yeah, we, we do get some support, um, but as I said, I think it, the bigger issue is just finding a cultural fit. Yeah, and I'll throw it out here, and I assume it may be the same up there, is that like my granddaughters, for instance, are in a Votech high school, not a regular high school, so they can get the experience of going out and looking at businesses and trying to learn a little bit. Do you have that opportunity up there? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Oh, for good. Sure. Okay, yeah. that helps then too. Yeah. Um, and you know, back to what Sachin was talking about, which is actually the I'll call it the supply chain. Obviously, your product is a challenge in many ways, um, just in general, because first of all, you're harvesting fish of a different set of varieties. There's a demand on one side, there's a harvest on the other side. You're trying to match the harvest capability and with the demand as well as you can. And at the same time, it's not so simple because in some cases they're saying, I'll just take the fish as is, just you know, give it to me frozen or whatever. In other cases yeah. you're saying, no, I want it fresh. There's, there's a bunch of things that I assume are somewhat challenging on the planning end to get this right, matching the demand and the supply. Yeah, well, uh, certainly, and and um, uh, you know, and it's not. It's more matching. Yeah, I mean that the supply is we don't necessarily control it. All, all the boats have a certain amount of quota that they're allowed to catch, and we we plan that out and spread it out. But you know, uh, you can't control how many spot prawns uh, the boat is going to catch every day. You do, you put your traps right. out and you hope for the best. Yeah, and so, yeah. so you get these peaks and waves. And so, yeah, we do have to match that demand. Interestingly, um, this was one of these real shifts, paradigm shifts that we had to deal with was when we, when we were selling, to, when we are and when we were selling to chefs, uh, we, the chef likes to take the fish in whole form and break it down himself because he uses everything. He uses the bones and frames for fish stock he use, and the heads and uh, you know, he, 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 they know where all the tasty morsels are on all the fish and they like to break it down themselves. Whereas when we started dealing direct with consumers, we had to, we had to break it all down for them. We had to make right. it very consumer friendly and very easy for them. So we were scrambling, you know, to we're, now we're taking, instead of selling a whole salmon, now we're selling a, you know, a six ounce portion, a frozen six ounce portion in a vacuum pack bag. Um, that we had to figure out to break down. And we did that with all our fish. We went into the freezer and said, okay, we're gonna sell this, 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 and this. And it wasn't because we were, uh, it, we were uh, long on the fish. It was that this is what we'll sell. This is what we'll sell direct to the consumer and that we can break down and, and uh, create a more user-friendly product. Yeah, and help me out because from the source, from the origin on the boat, um, all the way through to whoever the, uh, Final consumer is either at food service or uh, at home. Yeah. Uh, you have a cold chain in place, right? And you Correct. have different types of product that have different requirements for that cold chain. Correct. What kind of technology is in place to ensure, in a sense, the cold chain works all the way through? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, they, um, we so for sustainability issues, there is a um, there is a uh, chain of custody. So you can track the product all the way through the system uh, on a number of products, most of the products that we carry. But um, there is no one, uh, you know, one unique traceability uh, solution that everybody is working on. This this industry as a whole is very uh, disjointed. And when we buy direct from our when we take the product from our boats, we buy direct from our boats, you know, we can manage that ourselves. But the challenge, as I said, when we're bringing product in from Hokkaido, Japan, or from Mexico, 
you know, how do you, how do you manage that? And how do you manage the supply chain, uh, keep that cold chain uh, uh, going? You know, that there's a lot of uh, talk now about, uh, uh, Sachin, you, you brought it up about blockchain. So some vertically integrated companies now in the seafood industry, larger companies uh, are looking at utilizing blockchain. They're working with IBM and others on uh, utilizing blockchain or other traceability solutions uh, that they can at least uh, carry that data and uh, all the way through the system, those uh, key performance indicators all the way through the system. Yeah, you're right. Blockchain is one technology that can really offer the traceability issue, say the proof from origin to destination, yeah. that we, in a sense, maintain that cold chain. You have a complete record of it, which is kind of very, very important. The other side of that, and you also hit another issue there, is the fact that there is no quote, industry standard for how you define the data. Yeah. So there, there um, oh, sorry, there's, there's no one solution, I should say, is what you actually said. There is no one solution that's going to integrate everything, which is true. Yeah. So usually industries that have that challenge, the best way to get there from here usually is to say, let's define some common standards and you can use yours, I'll use mine, but we'll both have the same standard of data that makes the data interchange very easy. Yeah. So hopefully that uh, standardization in sense in the architecture, that's one of the challenges we look at on our end too, is how to standardize data interfaces for sure. Yeah, um, so there yeah, is... Um, uh, and that's been a challenge for, for the longest time. So there was a group of, uh, um, that got together in pre-competitive collaboration. It was originally um, um, uh, facilitated by uh, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, an NGO. But it was really these pre-competitive uh, groups, retailers, seafood uh, members, fishers, harvesters, that all got together and um, started discussing what are the key data elements, the KDEs that um, we can all agree on that need to be captured uh, along the supply chain. And, um, and so they've created a 2.0 or 1.0 uh, version of those key data elements that they are hoping that the industry will, um, will um, accept and start to create a uniform uh, um, uh, set of uh, key data elements. Yeah, that's, uh, you're right. That's the heart of at least starting to say, what are the transactions? What are the data elements we need for those transactions? And then figure out what systems will be able to support them or integrate to them. That's good, yeah. excellent. So that, that gives you a solution to that problem. Uh, that's at least in flight, I'll say, even if it's not ready yet, which is good. Yeah, because there's nothing more frustrating than when a, a retailer or one, one group or even a restaurant group says, well, I want this information. And another group says, I want this information. And they're, you know, so you're capturing different information for different groups. And um, we just need to, as an industry, come up with what one unique uh, set of uh, um, key data elements. So, yeah, and so uh, about all the products. And so to your point, it's orig origin to destination, but also within that, um, I don't know well enough the industry properly, but I'll say if I were on the consumer end, depending on who I am, I probably have different concerns. Uh, actually, Sage and I may have very different concerns. Yeah. You know, he's a healthy guy and he wants to know, um, or he's, I'll say, he's more into ethical sourcing, let's say, than I am. Yeah. So he'll want to know what can you show me about your product that I just bought uh, from a sourcing perspective? Give me that information. I'm coming around saying, hey, I'm 30 pounds overweight. What can you show me about? And the fact that I can't have sodium in my diet, what else can you show me? So you have probably a lot of different information you need to carry about the product across that chain to the end customers, I guess. Uh, you, you hit the nose on the head. I mean, it, 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 it really is, um, there really are uh, multiple uh, things that consumers look for when they're making a purchasing decision. You know, obviously we know that uh, quality and, and price and taste are, are number one number two and number three, but, um, you know, behind that, whether it's sustainability or whether it's local or, or all those, uh, whether it's healthy or all those no additives, you know, are all those things that uh, the consumer looks for, 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 for that decision. Yeah. And I, I do know from your website, you do have a lot of information on the website about your whole process, the product, the quality, the sustainability practices, a lot of detail up there. I do know at the same time, kind of like when I go into a supermarket, I'm looking at the product and I just say, what's on the label? 
I'm sure you have label challenges as well to communicate yeah. what, what you need to on the label. Yeah, for sure. And you only yeah. have so much space. So That's right. Right. So that said, um, the other thing I was going to ask about is you have um, in the chefs, uh, in the food service market, it's a different kind of deal because the chefs are going to tell each other where I got this stuff from. Yeah. And the chef's going to try the product and go, oh, this is really different. He's then going to learn about the product because he's a chef and he will care. He'll want to know the end to end story, where did it come from? Was this from a Russian nuclear plant or was it sustainably yeah. fished? Whatever the story is, he'll figure that out because he'll want to do his own homework, right? Yeah. But with yeah. the consumer, it's different because, you know, chefs don't come to me and say, hey, Jim, let me give you a good tip on what to buy. You know, forget about what you're looking at as, you know, quote, farm raised catfish or something, try something yeah. different. Yeah. So somehow you, besides, I know you have the website, which does a very good job. In addition to that, are there any other thoughts on how to reach that consumer? Because I'm the guy that doesn't know. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, there's a, a lot. What we're finding um, with direct to consumer is, you know, we never, ever had to invest in marketing before. And so now we are actually in the process of hiring a marketing director or, or a, a chief marketing director. Um, because that's such a critical role for us to be able to message to the consumer and get more consumers on board um, is through marketing. So whether it's paid paid uh, social media, paid search, um, you know, uh, organic growth, uh, just getting more people uh, on our site um, and getting the word out um, to them through email campaigns and uh, various methods. Uh, is so critical for us to be successful. You know, I'll throw one more thing out there, and you've mentioned it when we talked before, the fact that uh, beyond just, in a sense, the quality of the food you're producing for the market, the other thing is, um, and I, actually I'll give you credit too, uh, which I didn't mention, but you, you brought it up. I don't know how big Richmond is, but the point of it is you're producing, in a sense, jobs and income for that community for sure. And that adds a lot of value to any community, you know, to have a plant like yours creating jobs, which is good. But you also mentioned too, that in a sense, the company itself has a sense of social responsibility. Yeah. And so beyond the sustainability stuff, um, which we, we have talked about, it's, there's a set of social responsibilities that you also try to fulfill. Maybe you could tell yeah. me a little bit. Yeah. About you bet. That. And thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, well, we actually, um, the reality is we think sustainability, too often people think sustainability is about the environment, um, but that's only one part of sustainability. To us, sustainability is the environment, it's your business, the uh, economics of your business, as well as, um, as, well as the social component. It's, uh, and so we spend a lot of time uh, focused on the social side as well. And um, when one, when, one thing that um, garnered us a lot of, gets us a lot of attention is our, our social uh, program. So we actually, for every order that we receive, we donate uh, seafood uh, towards two uh, nutritious meals for those in, that are in need. Um, and because of that, we get a lot of media exposure, free media exposure, uh, both on uh, uh, TV and, and uh, newspapers, magazines. Um, and that has, that has helped us uh, broaden our reach and get more people uh, focused because of the, that social component built into our, our model. Um, in addition, we're a B Corp company. So it's about uh, B Corporation is about caring about the environment and caring about the social uh, well-being of the, uh, of the community and our employees. Um, and and uh, so we we do focus a ton of attention on our investment back into the communities that we work and, and do business in. Yeah, actually that's a big deal. So like in my case here, where we are at Farm to, on the company I'm working with at Farm to Plate, what they're trying to do, we realize as we've taken a closer look at the food chain, that when you talk about sustainability, it's not just, as you say, the environment, that's a, a check mark. There's many yeah. check marks. And, and the truth of it is there's this now metric, the UN uh, has these uh, established these 17 sustainability development Correct. goals, which hit yeah. a lot of the areas you're talking about. Yes. And I think it's almost like I'd say uh, a labeling issue. I wanna know the sodium and the calories. It's also uh, in Sajan's case, he'll say, and what are, what's your impact on the sustainability goals? And yeah. you've hit quite a few check marks. The whole focus you have on all the stakeholders throughout the chain, 
uh, the quality, uh, all of that stuff uh, would hit many of those things from a marketing yeah. perspective. But it's interesting yeah. you say that because on our website, we actually uh, measure our um, performance based off the UN sustainability goals. So yeah. we actually have a section um, that, uh, you know, um, and where the, the goal okay, and hunger, and, um, we actually, if you click on that, it will tell you uh, what we're doing as a company towards uh, trying to fulfill that United Nations goal. Yeah, that's really awesome. And that's the kind of stuff, in addition to me worried about calories and fat and protein, that's the other stuff I need to know about as well. And that's really great that you, you make that easily available. The only other thing I'll throw out there, and I don't know if you've thought about it, a lot of times, um, again, I'll think differentiating your product from the other products that are out there is easy on the chef side because the chef is going to tell the whole story. Yeah. And you, you, they don't need a lot of help from you probably. But on the consumer side, <clears throat> where there's no chef telling me why this product is different, um, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, the website is really good. Sometimes people use what they call these explainer videos to introduce yeah. a new concept. And for me, you know, hitting your website, I learn a lot. But sometimes making the contrast between here's probably what you're doing now and here's wh where we're different. Yeah. Um, in a little, you know, one or two minute video, those kind of things are pretty powerful sometimes. Yeah. Story. Yeah, we certainly, you know, we hear it from our customers all the time, uh, especially new customers that, um, you know, we want, once they try our product, they're amazed at the difference our product is compared to what they've been buying in the past. And, um, and that's, um, we do need to figure out a way to be able to message that uh, to the to uh, somebody who, who could be a potential customer for sure. And I will say as a consumer who bought the wrong fish, <laughs> I remember once buying bluefish, cooking it up at home. And then my wife and I looked at each other and go, hey, you know what? Your lips are all swollen. It's like, uh-oh, we were buying stuff that was loaded with mercury at the time. Right. I didn't know it. Um, so yeah, bottom line, figuring out easy ways to communicate to the broader market, that same message that the chefs already understand is a good thing for sure. Yeah. Um, so excellent. Cool. So that, that really covers an awful lot. Um, we talked about the packaging. Oh, a little bit, um, Sachin, I'll slip it back to your area. Um, any other questions you have before I uh, move to uh, finalize mine? Sure, I'm sure we're on the top of the hour. I just want to ask one question uh, in terms of you know innovation and technology. I know the industry is changing rapidly with the pandemic, so yeah. much change is happening. How do you see, you know, this whole thing kind of, uh, you know, the technology aspect of it, the innovation, you know, uh, to kind of have a more outreach to the consumer. Uh, so, you know, how do you see the digital transformation in your side? Yeah, um, I mean, we're, we're a pretty simple company. Um, you know, the technology that we're interested in is traceability, DNA authentication, that but you know there are there's a ton of tech uh within our industry coming up like uh uh closed containment recirculated aquaculture systems where you can basically create a, f a facility that grows seafood on land and uh and you can build one of these close to any major metropolitan area uh so you're going to reduce your carbon footprint etc um, but there are some challenges associated with that. Um, and, um, and so the, I'm, there are, um, it hasn't been completely solved, but that's a growing uh, trend. Uh, on the tech side, certainly uh, uh, growing uh, seafood, um, um, like from lab, laboratories, is uh, cell growth is, is uh, is an up and coming uh, technology, but you know that's just not who we are as a company. We're we're the actual fishers. We're we're out there. Um, you know, if somebody we're and we're more about doing things that are unadulterated, um, that are clean, natural, um, not grown in a laboratory. Um, you know, so we're we're less for for us the technology that as I said, that we're interested in is really just to augment uh, the positive things that we're doing. So whether it's traceability or, you know, the big one for us right now is there's a lot of mislabeling of seafood within the industry where people are, uh, where uh, there's people, or usually what happens is they take a lower grade product and sell it as a higher grade product. 
And um, so we actually do independent uh, third have our have all our seafood independently third party um, DNA authentic authentified um, annually. Uh, so they just come in. We don't know when they're going to come in, um, and they take samples of all our product to make sure it matches exactly what we say. Then they uh, publish that information untampered on, on our website. We don't have the results back from our, uh, it just occurred with us a couple, about a month ago. So we don't have the results back, but soon we will and it'll be on our website. Actually, that's a big deal in the US. You bring that up, I'll call it that certification of quality um, yeah. is enormous because in the US there's a big issue with, I'll call it one food chain here that was claiming I got tuna. And they said, well, yes. wait a minute, it's not yeah. tuna. And so the fact that you can say, I've got this product, this great product, and it's healthy for me. Oh, and by the way, it's certified end to end. Yes. And that's where all that technology you're talking about provides support for those kind of groups with the consumer. Exactly. Value. That's great. That's excellent. Um, anything else, Sachin, on your end that you can think of? I think you pretty much covered everything, Jim. Thank you very much. All right. And so the, I guess the last thing is part of it, and it, all of your practices as well, there's in a sense, a bunch of things that you must be doing internally is what I call audits on things like cleanliness within the plant and all that kind of work, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We're a federal, federally approved facility. That means we can ship anywhere in the world. But um, what that also means is that our, our uh, sanitation uh, standards, everything is at a higher standard than if you were a provincial or state run facility. So, um, so we take it seriously, like for example, uh, it's hot here. Uh, I'm wearing shorts right now, um, but I could not go into the plant because I'm wearing shorts. I'd have to put on coveralls. I can't have uh, bare skin uh, showing, um, you know, very, very basic things, qu quite frankly, but, um, but it's very strict for sure. Yeah, the practices are great. I think if I were your new marketing director, I'd have a long time and a lot of story to tell, honestly. Uh, so it's it, like I say, it's a very, my little bit of exposure to the fish industry that I know locally, it's nothing like the story you've gone through end to end, which is very, very different. And, you know, a lot of credit to you and the company for not the quality, just the quality of product, but the fact that you have this broader mission as well, uh, I think that you're delivering on, which is oh, thank you. That's why I think this foodcast will actually be very valuable to the audience, in my opinion. Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting enough, you know, we've been interviewing these potential candidates for director of marketing and they keep saying, well, you know, am I going to have enough content? And we'll say, oh, you, you will not have an issue with oh, um, no, content. No, no. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate it. It's been awesome. guy. I, I think, like I say, the product's unique, the value's unique, the story's unique. The problem is that getting the story to everybody is not something. And hopefully future foodcast here, this podcast will be one little piece of, in a sense, one less item on the marketing list director's job. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, it's much appreciated. Very much. Thanks to both. Yes, you've done a great job. Really appreciate the time you took with us, and uh, you know, look forward to getting the podcast out uh, to everyone. So, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcast. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 